welcome to getting to know you. That's what I usually say when Jock and I get started with producing a program, he recording me talking. But today I'd like to expand on that because this is welcome to the hundredth in effect performance or program of getting to know you. It's hard to believe we started during the pandemic uh, it was Jeff Teener, who was then the executive, uh, the uh, chief uh, 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 president of the resident association, and he was worried about people at Stonebridge feeling isolated and not really connected with one another. And as we talked about what we might do, we thought let's use that old-fashioned now 1979 channel and see if we can't talk to people at Stonebridge and introduce them to other interesting people. Uh, and that would be sort of fun and they'd get to know something about what's going on here. We did that, but we did it very primitively, except that it was using high technology, a camera on a phone by uh, Robin and the resident director, as some people will remember, and her daughter putting it up wherever you put things like this up. I still haven't figured that one out. And, um, and that's how we got started. And Jock, I think, you figured out that you came in on the 18th uh, program, and so here we are. Now, this is sort of a test. If you started in the very beginning, did you notice that getting to know you is different than it has been? So part of the 100th program celebration is having a new opening, which we will run again at the end so you get used to it. But it was uh, because Jock, I think, mentioned it to a granddaughter who was a graphic designer, graduated from Northeastern, a real professional, and she said, you need something better than what you have. Time has passed. And so she's the one who designed what you saw today that may not have realized that it was new. It is. And that's our little gift to you. So now we can pay attention to what we had planned to do for this program, as we do for every program. And we're delighted to be celebrating Women's History Month. And we're celebrating that with a person who is a friend to many people here, Juliani McIntyre. When she happened to mention one day that she had this wonderful experience for a 40th anniversary celebration. Well, 40th anniversaries are sort of common around here, I think. So I didn't know what she was talking about. I was not talking about my birthday. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's right, or your wedding anniversary either. <laughs> um, so, so that led to my thinking about what she had done. And that led to when I thought about women's history, so much of our history as women is really captured before we had the vote. And as our country was changing, and becoming more industrialized, more um, uh, immigrants. And women were the ones who really solved those problems of how do the poor, how do the immigrants get engaged, how do children get educated who are not in that system. There was a big uh, divide between people who were wealthy and could go to school and had middle class values and people who didn't have a doctor. And so what I thought once I heard more about the 40th anniversary, was that Juliana was in that category of women who saw a need and did something about it. And I think we still do that, but we, now we have the vote and we use different ways of getting into it. But Juliana, tell us about your vision and why you were celebrating a 40th anniversary. Well, in the very beginning, um, my vision <laughs> did not materialize at all. I never expected to start a school or to be the, an administrator of a school. I was an artist mm -hmm. and I began painting and singing and writing and drawing and these in a very large family surrounded by eight siblings. And um, we always played, built things, made things, uh, entertained one another. Um, backyard play was our <laughs> favorite uh, thing to do. We lived in a large old house that accommodated everybody. We lived uh, cheek by jowl and it was a very diverse community because my parents were very oriented toward social responsibilities and so 
as often as not, we had three generations in the house as well as the two. Um, one of my brothers was severely autistic and I was his roommate. <laughs> and um, he neither spoke ever in his lifetime, 40 years, nor did he ever make eye contact. Uh, and he lived in his own world entirely. He paid no attention to other people. And I became so fascinated by my time with him, uh, his way of creating things. He had, despite all uh, indications otherwise, he had a genius for design. And we'd tear up colored papers and he'd make huge rug carpet-like designs on the floor with perfect symmetry. Um, he would build with blocks, um, all kinds of constructions, towers and things like that. And I began to feel that we were communicating through our creativity, that even a child who had nothing <laughs> between his ears, so to speak, <clears throat> was letting me know that he had imagination and that he could transform materials into something that was important to him, even though it often did not mean as much to those around him. Um, I grew up with a sense of inquiry about this child, and I spoke to a number of priests, therapists, mentors, teachers, about how a loving God could ever possibly have made a person who never communicated and did not respond to other human beings. So, I never got the answer to that. <laughs> so, but all of this was inside of you. Did but you say I, it was it, an inspiration for um, you? Well, it, it must have been because as I uh, trained in the art field main, mainly to become a teacher, um, I kept thinking if only I had him, uh, as, as one of my students, if he could just come back somehow. He was institutionalized, and mm -hmm. I did see him once a month, but not any longer than that. And I, I also thought the children I, I am teaching uh, have so much inside of them in the way of what I call children's wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, they have a creativity. If you want to get biblical about it, they're made in the image of the creator. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, mm -hmm. they love to build and make things and they like to know, they like to ask questions and they like to grow. So can this, this really possessed me right. as I went in. I started teaching at the college level, then the adolescent level, then the middle school level, then the elementary level and I ended up at, this pre at the um, early childhood level. That's when I started the school. So connect me now to 40 years and the celebration that you described uh, at this bucolic setting. Right, well, the first 15 years we were in a number of different locations. And this was a, a school that you then? Yes, Helen Craven, uh, the widow of a history professor at uh, Princeton who was a musician, and I put together a school uh, and a board of trustees, <laughs> a school that would focus upon um, the transformation that children long to have as they grow and as they learn. The transformation being uh, a really important part of any child's life from birth on and would focus upon uh, building and making knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now there are a number of other educational programs that are excellent mm -hmm. that focus on the same things, but we had no facilities. And so we had to depend, really depend very heavily on people. Mm -hmm. And we had to depend on people who were willing to work on a shoestring, <laughs> salaries were low, the rents were low, fortunately, and the churches that we resided in allowed us to use their kitchens and even their sanctuaries. <laughs> um, so would, would you we, say that after you did one year and, and things seemed to be 
happening and children wanted to go for another year? Yes. As you sort of made yeah. your way? Well, we both, both Helen and I had advanced degrees in education and we knew what the core curriculum should be <laughs> and we knew what the standards should be. Yeah. It wasn't a, a fly-by night. Right. right. But what we did feel was what was missing was a focus on the very thing that children dare to do mm -hmm. and want to do. And they do it through play, and that is transform. Mm -hmm. They go from one, they go from the known to the unknown every day of their lives. Mm -hmm. And they do it at risk because mm -hmm. often it's a mistake. Mm -hmm. Often they get lost, mm -hmm. but they continue to want to do uh, their learning in this way. And I call it their wisdom. And so we designed what on paper looks like a perfectly mm -hmm. ordinary curriculum yeah. um, to be taught in a way that the children would be constantly active. Yeah. Uh, they'd be outdoors, they would be building and making things. They built their sandboxes, they built with some parental help, yes. yes. <laughs> they built a lot of their furniture. We scavenged uh, rummage sales and yard sales and did everything we could to put together a school on a Monday morning. Mm -hmm and then put it to bed on a Friday <laughs> night. Because you were in rented space. Yeah, and again, start from scratch, plumb your depths, and get down to essentials. And, and so when you had your 40th anniversary of the school, it, had, it went for 40 years and grew and became yeah. What should I say? An institution? What was it they called? It did become accredited. It became an institution. But from the very beginning, the children needed to connect, they needed to be loved, they needed to be dared, mm -hmm. persuaded to do things they'd never done before, and they needed to have a lot of support. Mm -hmm. and, and this is how they learned the p very basic fundamentals of reading and writing and arithmetic and mm -hmm. social sociology right. or right. history. So. Well, we well, tried to meet their needs. At one well point, we uh, when we were talking about this, I said, well, how did you get the money to build the school? And, and, and I heard your story of doing everything that you possibly could to raise the money, and you learned about the lottery having special <laughs> grants, right? <laughs> and we looked, it, yeah. it took you three times to go to them, and as we found out, I knew the woman who made the decision that your school could... Karen Francine, yes, right. bless her heart. She's a wonderful woman. She understood what you were trying yeah. to do, like a lot of other people did. Well, the first time, I, the banks had turned us down. We were trying to borrow money to build a school since we couldn't find one that was acceptable to the planning board or the zoning board. Uh, we... <laughs> We had, we bought a piece of ground and we didn't have enough money among our school community to build anything. Mm -hmm. We couldn't even build a, you know, garden shelter, I don't think, with the money we had. Uh, so I was told that the lottery is um, a source for nonprofits. Um, and the first time I went, they sent over a group of men who <laughs> examined the school. Unfortunately, it was the day that we gave the children dead fish to dissect. Okay. <laughs> and I think every man who regarded the school that day decided it was really not something that they would want yeah. to expose their own children mm -hmm. to. Guts on the floor mm -hmm. and things like that. However, um, when Karen came, she brought with her um, the understanding of of children and their need for uh, connection and their need for love and their need for the kind of um, playful work mm -hmm. that uh, transformation involves. And she saw the joy uh, mm -hmm. of it and she felt that this was worth the, right. the uh, what, Economic Development Authority. And it turns out your location made it really a regional school that people yes. came from all over. And so on that 40th anniversary, that site was a place of excitement and... Yes, it was a, it, the bonfire is always a beautiful symbol. Mm -hmm. symbol. Mm -hmm. 
the night itself um, is. It's a sacrament. The whole thing is sacramental. And I, I've often thought, this is, I'm not telling you about, I'm, ta I'm telling you a love story. Mm -hmm. It's basic. I, I cannot describe it as a step-by-step, -step, well planned out um, formula. Right. I don't think those women who went before you understanding that people who other people had dismissed as not having intelligence or a will to learn and so on. Yeah. Uh, well, you need the tools. A, you have to. Yeah. We all have to have a certain amount of tools. Yeah. So, uh, but how to use them and how to um, let your spirit. The, the question that you're asking, what you really want to know, is going to uh, compel you to take the leap between what you don't know and what you do know. And children do that very readily, yeah. unless there's something that makes them fearful. Yeah, and or tells them to stop. <laughs> but one thing, um, when you spoke in your introduction, I was thinking, we were so diverse, and still are, mm -hmm. um, because we needed children. When you're building a school, you need children, right? Um, and we took children from every walk of life. We had a couple of homeless families mm -hmm. whose children came. We had a number of children from Hopewell, Pennington, Trenton, Ewing, yeah. and Cranberry. Um, farm children, city children, uh, children whose parents were wealthy, children whose parents had nothing. If they had nothing, we'd ask the wealthy ones to help pay for the nothing ones. And many people came giving a great deal more than money. Right. And they that really very, supported them. And the children were the ones who kept saying, let's have another grade level. Mm -hmm. Can you please put in another grade level? And the most recent- I want to stay here, right? <laughs> the most recent mm -hmm. in time example was in the COVID period, um, we had to shut the school down probably about half of that period. And the fifth graders who normally were the graduates mm -hmm. came to our present head, the wonderful Sylvana Clark, and they said to her, we missed out on our final year. Mm -hmm. And the final year has so many wonderful things that happened. Can you please give us a final year? Can you please give us a sixth grade? Mm -hmm. And so we've done that. And the children fly away like butterflies, but they do come back. Yeah. <laughs> they did, and they came back to celebrate. They came back, and the celebration celebrate was with. so happy. And um, the present school is just wonderful. It far exceeds any dream I ever had. Um, and the teachers and the the uh, faculty, the faculty and the administration are happy people. I want, I want to shift up because you now have it, the Princeton Junior School in good hands. I do. It, it lives on, but you have really continued in your your uh, your interest in art and teaching, uh, and I, I thought maybe it would be good to end this with your latest work of art that a lot of people. At, uh, at Stonebridge had seen. We're going to take just a little break while, while Jock turns the camera on that piece of artwork. I think uh, women are very adept at having more than one kind of career or interest that they really devote themselves to. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting here in front of uh, your latest piece of sculpture that I've seen. I know you're always working on something, but many people saw this um, when we brought it to um, the lecture that uh, Bob Geddes's friend gave. And, um, and you did this after he died, remembering him. Yeah. And, um, and I don't even know what question to ask a sculptor. Uh, because I can't imagine how you do this. Uh, well, you can, can, that, can you help bring this? <laughs> I'll try to make this close. very yeah. simple. <laughs> um, I'm a sculptor who works in clay, mm -hmm. or uh, a special, it's called plastiline. And it looks like this. It's just a hunk of clay. Mm -hmm. Bob Geddes was at one point 
this. Uh, weren't we all? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And um, I, I used this kind of armature wire mm -hmm. to build a kind of a light bulb shape mm -hmm. that sits on a work table. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a hole and the mm -hmm. wire comes up and I work it around. And then I use my my tools, which most of the time are my fingers, but at sometimes I use clay tools, mm -hmm. tools that have been fashioned for modeling clay. Mm -hmm. And I was trained um, to make sculptures. I started making them when I was about 15 years old. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a portrait painter, mm -hmm. and I think I inherited his gene. And so it's very much like starting a school. You start with very little. You start from scratch. You have very uh, simple materials. You get down to basics and you look, you have a subject mm -hmm. whom you want to connect with in some way. Mm -hmm. And you examine this person. I watched Bob talking to my husband mm -hmm. for hours and hours over the course of the two years that they knew each other. Mm -hmm. And Bob was always very inquisitive and very excited about what he was talking about. And I didn't say much, but I watched his face and I became intrigued by his spirit. Mm -hmm. it, it was a kind of a soul searching mm -hmm. spirit, I thought. And the night after he died, I had a dream that I did uh, a portrait of him. And the dream was long and it was very clear. So when I woke up that morning, I did a portrait of him from my memory in three hours, which is a miracle because I've never done a portrait in three hours, not even three weeks. <laughs> um, but it, it, once the portrait resembles a person, once you capture a likeness or once I capture a likeness, I always feel there's something much more there's something in the spirit of this person, the character of this person, which doesn't really rely upon what a person looks like exactly. It relies on the expression in his eyes or the expression on her lips or the way she watches, the way she listens, the way she talks, the way she shows what's going on inside in her interior or his interior. And I think I must have taken very, very careful visual notes throughout those hours of listening and watching Bob having conversations with uh, Dick because it takes play again. It's like the school, you want to make a connection. <laughs> a child wants to make a connection and you you take your materials as far as you can go and then you play with clay, little tiny pieces here and there. You look at the way the light uh, changes the expression of the eyes or light and shadow change the expression of the mouth. And you play with it trusting. That's all you can do because you're reaching into the unknown part of this person, the unseen part for something that's entirely indescribable. <laughs> and if you're lucky, and I pray to be given the, the chance, mm -hmm. every time, if you're lucky, a person begins to come through. A, per, a real honest to goodness character begins to come through. Which is, I would say, what you achieved with, with those hundreds of young people yeah. who trusted well, you and you trusted them. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I was, I was one of them. Whenever I do a sculpture, I feel as if I'm one of them. Right. I'm being challenged to do something that I've never done before. Well, it's been so, great to talk to you. Thank you. During Women's History Month. Thank to, you. To try to examine who we are and how we really make uh, a, a contribution to the world. And that's what we remember with yeah. history. So thank you yeah, very much, yeah. Juliana. Well, women know how to tell a love story. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So there you go, getting to know Juliana McIntyre, Princeton Junior School, and once again, Bob Geddes in a way. 
and uh, so we're really grateful. And now you are going to see the new getting to know you <laughs> once again. And so I, I hope you'll wish us a, a hundred more programs, or let us do a hundred more programs because it's up to you to watch them. Then they become something real. They don't until you do. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.